I brought Dave here because I believe he is a very interesting individual and is worth... I think I am too. Okay. Absolutely <laughs> fascinating individual. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most fascinating I know. Nice. And um, I just felt that it would be worthwhile bringing Dave into the media space because I believe a lot of what he has to say is very relevant. You started Casa Bio, which was previously, I believe, called Cape Biodiversity Atlas. You've been doing your homework, Edward. A little bit of homework, <laughs> yes. No, actually, yes. it was called the Collaborative Archive of Plant Ecology and Biogeography, which I'll be testing you on later. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. But, so essentially that's spelled Cape Bio. Okay. And I like that because it's biodiversity starting in the Cape, okay. uh, and the Cape is such an amazing place for all kinds of plants and animals, uh, so I was like, hell yeah, and it was my friend Daniel Wilson, who I set up the NGO with many moons back, more than 20, and he said to me, what about Casa Bio, because like we want to be on the Cape, I'm like, I know, I know, but Casa, like, uh, and he's like, South African biodiversity. Uh, I said, yeah, but I mean, it's not really South African. No more than it is Cape. It's, it's worldwide. And, and then I was like, wait a minute. Casa? That spells home. And I was dating a Spanish lady at the time. Uh -huh. So I, I thought, actually, that could work. The home of biodiversity. So that's how we got our present name. And that's the history behind the name. So it's got the important ingredients of cast collaboration, collaborative archive. We're a, in a sense, a digital museum of plants and animals. Um, and South African, we are South African, the organization South African, but we're attending to flora and fauna worldwide. Um, and indeed, potentially on other planets, Elon Musk. Um, <laughs> and then we're going to, yeah, and then biodiversity. That's primarily what we're interested in. But we're not necessarily constrained to biodiversity. For instance, and this is one of the things that make us stand out from other organizations doing citizen science up till now is that for me, I celebrate nature, including the geology, which is so critical to where plants and animals occur, both providing habitat, but also habitat specificity. So some plants, some animals choose very particular habitats. Um, and that includes the geology. And for instance, certain critters, mm -hmm dwell in caves and these guys have absolutely adapted to cave dwelling and they've lost all but their eyesight and uh, and they're entirely albinous, al white because pigments cost energy to create. Interesting. Interesting. So uh, eyes cost energy to create. Um, so I think it's rather intriguing. Wow that when we, when we silence that visual part of our brain by closing our eyes, we tend to become more receptive from a sound point of view. And so I love that these cave creatures have honed their sense of touch, they've honed their sense of hearing, um, and yeah, I love looking at the macro world as well. So if, if one examines the hairs, nearly all very small org animals have got hairs on them. From the, yeah. In the case of the very smallest of organisms, those hairs, silly, are for locomotion, movement. But as they get a little bigger, they become useful for, as a sound engineer, Edward? They become useful for hearing. Yes. But You've got tiny silly in your ear. Exactly. Silly, silly. So it becomes an extension of touch and mm. the sound, you when you reach such small scales, sound and touch become uh, melded into one. Mm. 
And so the question is, when you're at bigger scales, is that still the case? Myself being a rather hirsute man, uh, is that the case for us? Mm. Some guru gurus who have extended themselves in that direction in terms of being capable of perceiving the slightest minutiae of touch and sound claim to be able to uh, feel sound with their hairs, be able to see through their skin. That's crazy because our skin has photoreceptors. That's why it turns brown when the sun goes on it. Okay. So I think it's not entirely without merit such a suggestion. Could be a low resolution image, perhaps, because I don't know how much definition you could get through your skin cells, but mm -hmm. I'm not a guru in India or wherever in the world. No, you're not. Neither am I, Edward. <laughs> guru Dave. <laughs> Um, but on that topic, there are, there are, I was examining a creature, ah yes, ah, um, I'm not going to go into this, but the, these lizard allies have got eyes, they, they split into several groups, one has eyes on stalks, the other has eyes in pits, and the third has the eyes almost gone. They're covered by uh, skin, essentially. Yeah. And I have a blind friend. I call him my NBF, my new blind friend. Now my ex-NBF, because we had a breakup. <laughs> snape, snape. Um, but Ryan is his name, Ryan Childs. He has an incredible ability to utilize his third eye as a means of visualizing what he can perceive, what's in front of him. Mm -hmm. So when I met him, he, uh, I had him on my arm and I stepped up and he stepped up as well. And I was like, oh, sure, but I forgot to warn you about the pavement coming up. So he says to me, um, I said to him, how did you notice that? He said, I saw it. I said, okay. if I'm not mistaken, you're blind. <laughs> I said, so how did you perceive it? He said, with my third eye. I said, which eye? <laughs> um, so he said, no, I can use my third eye to perceive that, which is wrong. So I said, okay, so you've not been here before. It's not like you've, you know this. He said, no, I haven't been here before. So I said, okay, so what's around you if you look now? And he sort of takes on this look and he's and he looks around and he says there's some metal things standing up here, there, and indeed there were these bollards around him. Now it's not like he's being a bat and echo locating at the time. I truly believe through subsequent research that he was perceiving using his third eye. Um, and he was able to see within my body and pick up fractures in my bones that I was unaware of. And when he told me, I'm like, oh yes, my friend did carry on me on my shoulder and for several weeks I had a sore rib. So it's that kind of uncanniness that sure. creatures in the world around us possess. And we have no idea, but our conception that the world around us is as we perceive it is just so strange considering the the vast swath of spectra both audio visual and uh yeah sense sensory in general yeah see smell hear taste touch feel yeah you you talk you talked about those animals in the cave that lost their ability to or not lost their ability but adapted to utilize the senses that they need the most and I like the way you put it you said that costs energy to make eyes it costs energy to produce like brown skin as opposed to just being white and having no pigment um, you you said they were albine. Yeah, albino. Albino, essentially. Albino yeah. 
cr uh, critters, critters in the cave. Wow. This sounds a little bit like what some of what I've read in uh, The Secret Life of Plants. Um, and there's another book written by the same author where he talks about people in, in I think in Malaysia or in, in the islands in Southeast Asia um, navigating the sea without maps and knowing knowing the stars so well that they can they can, they can identify how far they've traveled and find a tiny little island like several hundred kilometers through, through a piece of ocean with no other land in sight and so to hear hear what you're saying about your your friend what did you say his name was again ryan, ryan yeah. to hear about ryan being able to pick up that they were bollards and and to perceive that you have a fracture in your ribs mm -hmm. is really extraordinary and but this kind of latent ability is something that i think humans have had in the past and we consider that every animal besides us seems to have the ability to innately navigate the landscape to the point of um giving birth so reproducing so every organism is able to reproduce pretty much without much care there's a few exceptions but most things without much care and they do so through instinct. And my big question is, what is human instinct? What have we still got that is more or less vestigial, but it's still there, but is hidden under various layers of conditioning, for instance? Hmm. I mean, we're incredibly social creatures. And from the first moment where uh, we're lying in, in our cot and uh, mummy goes like hoo -doo, hoo -doo, and then we <laughs> and then we laugh and and mummy's like oh excellent like reinforces it um, that <laughs> social conditioning from day zero just about yeah so um, we have as humans got these instinctual things and there was a story, just as an example, on navigation. So birds navigating across continents effortlessly. Instinctual things are effortless. And so this kid was taken, put in a, a vehicle, and he was uh, essentially a sand kid. So one of the precursors of m modern humanity. And he was put in this, I don't know if it was a cart or a car, carted over 200 kilometers. He was something like five years old. And when he was let out, he managed to escape and he made his way back home. <laughs> That's uncanny. But the only way he could have done that is through instinct. Nothing else. He didn't know the landscape. He didn't know astronomy. Mm. So... That navigation that, of which you speak, spoke earlier, mm. that's the kind of thing that we have latently within us. And, and if we cultivate it, especially from when we're young and before we've put up all these filters, we can engender those things. So this is my attempt as a city, city zen, um, is going barefoot, is being a bit more in touch with the world and Nudity for me represents uh, sloughing off these clothes, clothes that provide these protective measures, these protective layers, and prevent us from feeling, not just feeling the outside, but feeling inside as well. Mm -hmm. And so when we're naked, we're more susceptible to all manner of things. And that is why I use the moniker the naked botanist because for me that is truth you can't be more truthful than being naked they talk about death as the great great, great equalizer mm. but i think it's nudity <laughs> because <laughs> unless you have tattoos you're pretty much all alike and um you are what you are you present as you are um 
yeah, many people use clothes earlier on. You said, let me put on, put on, a put on a jacket, put on a jacket, David. So I did. But um, even in doing so, I choose, chose this because I feel the normal jacket to be pretentious. Mm. So there's judgments on the clothes we put on. So we wish to project that judgment to other people watching us. Mm. So if we can take away those things, the only judgment is how we present ourselves. You said a few things there that I want to re reflect just so that I can be sure that I've got them. So the last thing that you said, I really liked it. Um, the idea that is death the great equalizer? No, nudity is the great equalizer. And it, it is. If I, if I imagine myself in, in a rather difficult situation, not rather difficult, like very problematic situation like Auschwitz, where you're stripped of everything, mm. like that's, you, you, you realize the commonality between you and other human beings, but also it's, it's, it's somehow it's like your pride is taken from you. Mm. And pride is, if I'm correct, is um, one of the seven deadly sins. So mm -hmm. I kind of can't help but wonder if a lot of the problems that we face in the world today are as a result of the suit and tie, like trying to maintain some sort of semblance of I'm more powerful than you and taking the clothes away. Like it's the way to bring everyone back down. You all, we're all just humans. We all have bits and we need to reproduce if we want our genetics to carry on. Um, which is an interesting incentive. I liked what you said about the sand boy, the five-year-old mm. boy all the way several kilometers away from where he was at age five and with instinct being able to re-navigate back home. That's that is really extraordinary, and as you say, like it's, it's, it's senses that go beyond just what, what memory and seeing. And okay, yes, that tree, the the sun rises. It's like ingrained in you, and yeah, that's. Oh, I wanted to ask you what the word moniker means. Like you said that um, that it was a moniker. Mm. Um, it's a handle. It's it's the handle that you use. The, yeah, yeah. So it's. I would say that's what it is. It's a handle. So it's yeah. a, I feel like, do you know what the etymology of the word is? Which mm, no. Or but which language it comes from? No, I mean, it's, no. Yeah. But it is a sequitur to the use of common names and scientific names for identifying plants and animals. Okay. And... So if, if this is a biological podcast you're doing, Edward, <laughs> let's get into it, shall we? <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't know, one of the major aspects of biology is taxonomy. And it's hand in glove with nomenclature. And taxonomy is more or less the identity of an organism and placing that organism within a framework. Um, now that framework has most recently in 1753 been uh, agreed upon as the binomial system of nomenclature. Now what this means is that each species, each unit of an organism that is a common unit, as opposed to an individual, can be named by just two names. And that's the genus name and the species name. In the case of humans, Homo sapiens. Okay. Um, and if one looks at humans, there's an extraordinary amount of diversity within us. And one of the key characteristics of one of many tens, if not close to a hundred biological species concepts, is that of uh, being able to mate and create fertile offspring. So, oh, interesting. For instance, a uh, an ass. Uh, when a donkey and a mule mate, they create an ass, an ass, and this thing is perfectly functional other than being able to mate and produce fertile offspring 
So, so that's not a species then. It, it yeah. can reproduce, but the, what it reproduces does not produce offspring. Is that what you're saying? Or it can't reproduce well, it, at all? Well, if it doesn't reproduce, I don't know if it can back reproduce with the donkey or the mule. Okay. But it certainly can't breed with another ass to create another ass. Okay. So, so it's not that it's, its offspring won't be fertile, but maybe it is not even fertile. It's not fertile. It's not fertile. Okay, but so I that's the one saying. species concept. It's called the biological species concept. Okay. And uh, our old lecturer used to say, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, then it's a duck. Okay. With plants, we don't have that um, luxury of being able to hear the plants talk, let alone walk. Mm. Um, <laughs> except in the case of fictional triffids. Or in time-lapse. Or in time-lapse, Edward, exactly. <laughs> There's this wonderful scene in a Felton Flora, which is a local magazine, yeah. in which they had a time-lapse of a local plant showing extraordinary rates of growth. And it had this person being like engulfed by, and they obviously had time-lapsed it, and being engulfed by this plant as it grew over him. <laughs> and eventually there's just a pile of clothing on top of the, um, <laughs> that sounds cool. on top of the plants. Um, but yeah, certainly. If it walks uh, like a duck, it talks like a duck. Yes. Then it's a duck. But with plants, it's not the same thing. Right. So then, how do we determine if something's a species, if it's a plant? Well, again, there's lots of different concepts for this. I use a hybrid approach. So it's, it can loosely be considered a kind of consensus approach. So you take evidence from all sorts of things, morphology, what the plant looks like, uh, even the smell of it, uh, the chemical composition, the genetics of it. And when you combine all this evidence, you then get uh, an idea of what it is. But that still doesn't answer the question of whether it's uh, a variation within a population Mm. or variation between populations, whether it's within a species. So there's an arbitrary uh, delineation of when something is a different species or not. And so nature doesn't give a damn what species, whether it's a species or not. Nature just is. We as humans find it convenient for a whole lot of reasons, including conservation, to delimit organisms into species, genera, families, orders, into the taxonomic framework. And, um, and, but we're aware at all times that it is a false framework okay. and it prov provides a useful handle for asking questions and answering them. That's really the purpose of it. So questions like, is this species rare? Do we need to therefore give a particular uh, protection or can we lump it with another species and therefore we can build on this site because that one over there is the same thing and we're still preserving the genetics of it, the genetic profile of it, the key characteristics mm. of it. So that's the utility of, of taxonomy. Of taxonomy. And it's what I've uh, done a lot of. And with my plants, um, it's enabled me to discover many new species. Mm. I, I like what you said about it being a false framework. And my perception of what that means is that even though we can do our best to say this is this, is this, this is that, that's that, and it belongs to that and it comes from that, at some point someone along the line goes, no, it's not that. Look, here, yeah, this genetics is not right. And suddenly everything shifts. So you're acknowledging that there's maybe a probability that what you're what you're classifying it as, and it belongs to this family line and this um, yeah, this family tree, if you will. Suddenly you can find out that it's false, and that's maybe not actually that relevant. But I mean, I love this. This is um, our nature as scientists. 
we deal with hypotheses. We deal with um, probability on a regular basis. So when we talk about the truth, the, we're, we're understanding that it's a hypothesized truth and that it's not the actual factual truth and that facts themselves aren't, there we go, um, facts themselves aren't genuine 100% facts. Facts themselves have a hypothesis and there's room for error and learning and improvement. And this improvement and this room for error is so fundamental that it's the basis for um, evolution. Hmm. You're talking about the taxonomical framework and that is false and that as scientists you regularly you have to hypothesize things. You have to, you have to believe something so that you can go forward from there. Otherwise, if you're always just questioning everything, you don't, you can't make progress. Um, so I don't question everything by all means, Edward. <laughs> you can question everything, and it's a good idea to question everything. But in yeah. order to be able to move forward with a certain, one needs to make assertions, and yes. you need to, and this is how. It's fundamental to how we are. So when people say they are not biased, uh, when they say they're being objective, there's almost no such thing of objectivity because we are uh, cataloging creatures. By our very nature, we're constantly putting things into categories. One of the most basic and necessary is threat versus not threat. Um, and identifying that, categorizing something as a threat is critical to our survival. Um, that makes me think of a podcast I was listening to. This guy was going on a run in his tackies, you know, in New York. And he was running down the road and all of a sudden he just, for, as far as he could tell, no reason whatsoever. He just leapt off of the pavement where he was running into the road and was like his heart was beating really fast and upon further investigation he discovered that there was a statue of a lion <laughs> <laughs> that was clearly very accurately done about five meters up just out of his viewpoint uh, and it just goes to show that the subconscious is always there doing doing whatever it mm. needs to do making the heart beat making the eyes blink making the lungs breathe even when we're not thinking about it and keeping us alive from potential threats it's like that. I mean, I, I love watching cat videos where you see like cucumbers and, and <laughs> um, things coming up to the cat and the next moment it just freaks out and <laughs> like gambles and like massacres into all sorts of things. Um, but the closest I've seen to that, the most iconic was Adam Harrow, my friend Benbo. Um, and he was walking along just behind me and I stepped over a puff adder, which is the world's quickest striking snake Gosh. and carried on going. And Adam didn't see it properly. And he goes, Woo! and his legs just like leap into the air and he's like <laughs> <laughs> treading air. Um, and he did a massive jump and, <laughs> And that same sort of thing happened to me when I was playing ultimate Frisbee on the field in the Drakensberg at 2,500 meters kind of thing. Yeah. And there was a lightning storm around. And without even realizing it, I had left the ground. <laughs> because I hadn't consciously realized it, I was still running <laughs> in the air. And when I landed, my feet weren't in the right place. Oh, no. And I then like fell sprawling on the ground. And that was a thunder flash and lightning that had simultaneously gone bang. Um, but also an interesting reaction because probably the right one in the case of the thunder flash, because you don't want to be grounded, you want to be in the air. So incredible. <laughs> It might go through you back down to the ground. <laughs> I don't know how seamless that <laughs> is. It's just the temperature of the plasma that you have okay. to worry about. Okay. When in a lightning strike, remember to jump, especially when you're at 2,500 <laughs> meters. Good and luck. Dragon Mountains, Drakensberg.
I didn't I didn't know that the puff adder was the quickest striking snake. I knew that they were really dangerous. We also used to get mm -hmm. them at home. And they used this gentleman up the road who used to come and collect them for us, Syrian Robertson. Mm. Until one day he got he got bitten. No. And he's I think he I don't know if he lost his thumb, but it became very black and very big and very yeah, very swollen. And he said it, it wasn't all that pretty and <laughs> after that he became a little bit more careful mm. with handling snakes. Um puff adders. So puff adders are these big fat snakes, and when they expand and contract, they can make a hissing noise, hence puff adder. Yeah. And they are and all that mass is not there purely for cosmetics it's it's muscle hence them being such quick striking snakes yeah. but they're very lethargic snakes and they rely very heavily on camouflage so they're hence not seeing it and walking along and then adam <laughs> getting a fight yeah. Sheesh. so as you mentioned that it made me think about your Upcoming Africa trip that you're planning. Mm. Yeah, I feel like that's worth mentioning. So I know that you've been keenly talking for a couple of months now about traveling all the way up through Africa. Uh, you've talked about the West Coast. You've also, I saw there was a slideshow thing happening the other evening. Well, not slideshow, you're looking at Google Maps and you're looking at a bunch of the different points and nature reserves and mm. hills and mountains and places to find plants. And yeah, I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about your. Hmm. thoughts and what inspired you to do an Africa trip? It's been on the agenda for many moons. I'm talking probably 15 years. Since a kid I was enthralled with solar energy and this ability to magically create energy from seemingly nothing, light. Hmm. Um, something we take for granted. So I've always wanted to do an electric car. No, I wouldn't say I've always wanted. But in later years that translated into desire to do an electric journey through Africa. Um, so, but my enthrallment with Africa is not purely botanical, let alone biological. It extends to natural history, humanity, culture, um, geology, mountains, um, so it's really going to be an exploration for me of what's out there. Um, so we've highlighted a number of key features along our route, including the biggest lakes in Africa, the highest mountains. And what we're going to be doing primarily is documenting the flora of the highest mountains, known as the Eastern Arc of Africa, Ooh. Eastern Arc Mountains. Um, and a term that I love is that of sky islands. This notion that each mountain represents an island in a sea of lowlands. And it's a sea because the plants on these mountains cannot readily jump to the next mountain because they can't navigate the lowlands. So they have to essentially do long distance dispersal to reach the next mountain. So these mountains can be quite close together, uh, separated by a few tens of kilometers. Yeah. Um, they can also be hundreds of kilometers apart. So in the south, uh, the mountains are hundreds of kilometers apart. But when we, I'm talking sort of Zimbabwe, Malawi, Tanzania. But as we get further north, um, they become relatively close. But one of the most astonishing discoveries in the last 10 years, I was at uh, the Eat Fat conference, which is on uh, African ecology and flora of the tropics of Africa. And one of the... African ecology and? It's, it's a French word, so okay. I'm not going to say it. Eat fat. Okay. Eat fat. Okay. Eat fat. It's not a... a it's not <laughs> a keto call to carnivory. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but... One of the outcomes of this was they found that the, is it called the Nile Valley? The Great Rift Valley, which is at least part through Ethiopia and Kenya, 
the mountains on either side of it, separated by a few tens of kilometers, were genetically, the organisms on these mountains were genetically vastly different compared with mountains even hundreds of kilometers away on the same side. So this great rift valley, not just for plants, but animals as well, formed a formidable barrier through deep time, geological time. Um, and those are the kind of things we can uncover through our meanderings of the plants, um, our exploration of the flora. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to be doing in a nutshell is documenting the flora of Africa and highlighting the plants, both localities and what plants. Um, and then with that, we can prioritize how we're going to tackle the question of how did the flora move around and evolve in Africa? Wow. Okay, you said a couple of things there that I didn't, I didn't know. Um, in spite of uh, having put my ears in on a couple of your meetings. Um, I knew I'd heard bits and pieces about traveling to some of the biggest lakes and the highest mountains. I'd heard the Great Rift Valley mentioned. Um, I was not aware of this idea of the Sky Islands, though. You say that plants at a certain altitude are essentially like an island in an ocean of sorts, because those plants can't traverse down into those densities or depths mm. in the same way that our human bodies, I suppose, can't go down to the bottom of the ocean because we get crushed. Is it a gravity-based thing, or is that a... What is the reason that they that they can't travel down those mountains? Or are we sure that they can't, or is it just that they haven't, and they've had to develop an alternative, more efficient seed dispersal and propagation, self-propagation method? It's not that they can't or that they haven't. It's that it's not easy for them to do. So when climate was different, ameliorated, lower temperature, then these plants could move down to the lowlands and spread to other mountains more easily. But as the climate uh, warms through anthropogenic warming, for instance, because there's lots of natural warming as well, but uh, then the plants are forced up the mountains because for every 100 meters we go up the mountain, it changes by one degree. That's known as the adiabatic lap lapse rate. Um, a, and... Um, which means that as we go up the mountain, it gets significant, significantly colder. Um, so the implication of this is that if you are a plant at the top of a mountain yeah. and it gets a degree warmer, you have to move 100 meters higher to be yeah. in the same um, climate, climatic envelope. Like say, A climatic envelope is essentially the... Uh, the comfort zone of the plant. Jeez, so to maintain huge. that comfort zone, you've got to go 100 meters up. Now, mountains are special because because of the slope and the angle, you only need to move, if it was a 45 degree slope, you'd only have to move that distance uh, across in order to move the same distance up. So you'd only have to move 50 meters across to move 50 meters up and be half a degree colder or warmer. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're on the plains and it's virtually flat, you have to move tens or even hundreds of kilometers to change by a single degree. Yeah. So, uh, so this we can model, and with climate modeling and seed dispersal and things like that, we can ask the question, um, can this species survive anthropogenic climate change anthropogenic warming and uh, we can model it but what we don't have is good ways of keeping track of those organisms so that's one of the solutions that we're going to be providing that just makes me think of climate change like if a plant has to exert that amount of energy specifically specifically the plants that are on the flats like if that climate shifts by a degree, they're gone. I never understood that before because I've often heard like, 
Ooh, it's going to go up two degrees, three degrees. What, you know, what does that even mean? But now that you explain that, like if plants are adapted that, that closely, I mean, surely you have fluctuations in your temperature during the day. Is, there, is it like the lower limit and upper limit? Like yeah, exactly. So, so if things that aren't tolerant to freezing freeze, they're going to die. If things that aren't tolerate, tolerant to 41 degrees yo, hit 41 degrees, they're going to die. Yeah, that's just like, yeah, it's amazing how one degree can make all the difference between water and ice, essentially. But bearing in mind that one degree, we are regulated a very close temperature tolerance, our bodies. Because one degree's difference doubles uh, the rate of enzymes, for instance. Um, various bodily, uh, various chemical reactions are doubled. So if you change by just one degree, hence the body get a, getting a fever. It needs to um, up the rate at which it's tackling the virus, the uh, pathogen. And so it ups the temperature, it's able to pump out way more defenses. But in That's the case of plants, uh, one degree can make a huge difference. That is super cool. i would also never known that before. So that's why your body gets hot when you get a when you get a cold. <laughs> <laughs> that's strange irony. I think that's one of the main reasons. Yeah. Okay. I mean, enzymes. Yeah, I've heard before. Enzymes are basically catalysts. They can. I heard a nice explanation and I don't want to share it. Um, an enzyme, something that requires an enzyme, if with the enzyme, it can increase the, the, the rate of a chemical reaction by up to more than a billion times. So if something would, a chemical reaction were to take one second with an enzyme in your body, without an enzyme, it wouldn't even happen in your life. Mm. So wow. enzymes are so critical. Mm. Wow. Super critical. It's like trying to open up a massive stone door without the key. Mm. You could, and you, all you've got is a spoon and maybe your fists. <laughs> it's not going to work. Okay, so like the, as you said, plants could potentially need to move as many as a hundred kilometers on the flats just to get that degree change shift in order to survive if there's a temperature shift. And then on mountain sides depending on which side of the mountain they are on, they could potentially slip around the one side, or it's easier to climb up or down. But still, as you say, they might need to move as many as 100 meters to change by one degree. That's, that's a lot of moving for a plant. Like, yeah. s some plants can move pretty fast, but most plants don't, in my experience. No, but you understand I'm not talking about plants themselves. Okay. The only way plants really move from a, the perspective of climate is through their seed. So it's the generational movement I'm talking about that okay. wasn't clear. Uh, so I was thinking of, and, and this explains why something like the Azoaceae. Um, so it's a group of plants, they're succulent plants. Most of them are in South Africa, but uh, they occur in many countries of the world. But one of the unifying characteristics of them, with a few exceptions, are that they are dispersed by short distance by rain drops. And so they move at the most 30 centimeters, 50 centimeters at a time, which means that to, coming back to that geology, uh, if there's a geological uh, island, if you want to call it an island, a geological patch and the mesem that's the colloquial name for it uh, from the word mesem briantomaceae the former family of azoaceae and derived from the word middle because they flower in the middle of the day mesos greek for middle so um if this mesem was on a patch of say limestone and the only other patch of limestone limestone was a hundred meters away, it could take them many decades or hundreds of years to jump across that gap to that next patch of suitable rock that's only a few hundred meters away. And what has 
resulted is that the mesomes have diversified more quickly than just about any other group in the world, any other plant group in the world. Um, but as a result, they are also incredibly speciose, so very species rich, and incredibly endangered. Many of the populations are very endangered. So uh, poaching is a huge threat to these plants. And, um, and that's one of the things we're wanting to ta tackle. Because, um, so CASPAR is creating a citizen science platform, and one of the key tenets of it is that we're wanting safety for the plants from poaching. Um, so these succulents are, well, I say poaching, but also agriculture. Yeah. So in order to know whether land can be utilized, we need to know about its value, biological value. And that's essentially what we're trying to do is find out what grows where, what those things look like. Um, so I call that a face and a place for every species on earth face and a place for every species on it. What it looks like and where it occurs. Okay, so like the Facebook of plants. The Facebook of plants, Edward. Yes, yeah. exactly. And I feel like uh, if you know someone, you love them. The same applies to plants and organisms. And so in the act of documenting, we get to know those organisms and if we then see their loss, it hits us hard. So we don't, don't want to see their loss. We want to see them kept Im immortalized, as it were. So that's where conservation comes into it. So through the act of um, engaging through Casabay and documenting the plants, we create this link to the organisms and then uh, hopefully conserve them. So with the mesums, mesum brianthemesi, what is yeah. it? Yeah, wow. perfect. Okay. Good um, going, Edward. Greek for middle, mesos. Uh, you said they've diversified around the world. And as a result of that, there's a lot of species that are endangered as a result of building or as a, as a result of poaching, people coming and digging up plants, either for monetary purposes or for essentially pirating plants, I don't know how yeah. to better put it. Yeah. Um, stealing plants, yeah. killing plants. From the wild, yeah. yeah. For um, their own personal collections for or for selling them. Okay. And and that's something that you're trying to avoid as in, in your comp with, the, with your business with Casabaya. Correct. So essentially other citizen science platforms have made the localities available and this has allowed poachers to essentially walk up to it and, and steal it. So by obfuscating the locality and hiding it, it makes it a little more difficult mm. for that process to happen. It's, yeah, it's not like, oh, you just come to this place and there it is right there at that exact geolocation and you pull it out. Mm. It's, it's a little bit less simple than mm. meeting at the local Pokemon event or whatever. <laughs> okay. And um, I, I want to say something about the endangered a factor within the mesums, within the mesum Briant Messi. So if if they've been really good at diversifying and you 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 say you're concerned about them being endangered, how long would it take for them to diversify? What is the benefit of having a broad biodiversity of mesum mesums or any plant? What what is the benefit? But specifically with mesums because you you mentioned that one and yeah, what, what, is the, what is the issue with not having a broad biodiversity of them? If they're so good at proliferating and, and diversifying, how long would it take for them to diversify again? What is the reason that it's a problem if we kill off species? Species are arising every minute of the day. Um, but they're also dying every minute of the day. <laughs> so there's this constant almost bubbling, the way bubbles grow and pop. That's happening the whole time. But only relatively few of them sustain themselves sufficiently 
to set seed, create a population, and for that population to become fixed for any reasonable length of time. So, um, so the complement of plants and animals that we have at the moment is a process dating back millions, billions of years even, uh, especially if you consider the evolution of the planets uh, as part of evolution as well. Uh, so, um, plants, so organisms create a whole bunch of benefits to humans, but those benefits are greater when there's a greater diversity of organisms and they're more resilient with biodiversity is greater resilience. So if there's a perturbation to the system, meaning like a, uh, almost like a push, like a, um, an assault on the system, then if there's diversity, some of the elements will be knocked more than others, but uh, some of them will survive that knock better than others. And they will then grow, create an ecosystem that um, can survive that and create a site that's suitable for the other things to grow back again. So that's in contrast to a kind of monoculture. Whereas if, if you get a fungus that hits that single crop uh, and spreads throughout it, all that's left is barren ground. Um, because there's nothing to buffer it. So it creates a buffer. So that's the value of diversity. Um, and then the other factor is that certain species are keystone species. The concept of this is that they are critical to the complement of organisms there for the ongoing and long-term functioning of that environment. So as an example, uh, like bees, Bees are considered a keystone species because they uh, affect pollination. And without them, many organisms are going to not be pollinated. Uh, another example would be, so that's an animal side. What? Oh, hang on. So acacias. Acacias would be an example of a tree keystone species because they provide shade for plants and animals and they persist the fire and without the fire the system may not uh, respond in the same way so it it maintains fires as an example um yeah acacias do yeah i thought acacias burnt i suppose they, they, their wood is quite hard so it doesn't burn as easily no the point being they do burn oh okay so you want the fires in that context so savannas are fire driven systems this ah. this means uh, and acacias occur in savannas savannas is a combination of grasslands and trees but uh, bushveld so one of the frequently used arguments against climate uh, carbon dioxide increasing in the atmosphere being a bad thing is people will say yes but uh, Carbon dioxide is fuel for trees, more trees is good, and therefore, um, therefore the tree, we're going to have a thriving environment. Yeah. The thing is, grasslands are more or less devoid of trees. If you increase the carbon dioxide level to favor trees over grasses, those grasslands turn to savannas, bushveld, and eventually forest. And that forest excludes this, the grassland species, which have been around for many millions of years. And so essentially you get a loss of this long-term genetic diversity. Um, and uh, and the, the system becomes depauperate, meaning poor in species as a result. Depauperate? Mm. So savannas move become bushveld if left if left for a long period of time. So that becomes bushveld and bushveld. So if it doesn't have a good fire regime. Okay. And 
And so this, the increased carbon dioxide favors woody plants, i.e. trees, and then that changes the fire regime. And the acacias are able to escape the fire trap and become big trees. They then put out more seeds than they would have before. And those acacias then begin to dominate the system. With trees comes more birds that have eaten the seeds of forest species. Ah. And they then land in the trees. They poop underneath the trees. And so forest species start growing up. And when you get to forest species, they tend to exclude fire. Forests resist fire. Um, savannas uh, and grasslands promote fire. Trees attract birds from the forest, and that's how the biodiversity over would it be over several hundred years, or just even would it be even tens of years, yeah. a decade? Okay. Wow, that's really fascinating. I could see it unfolding in my mind. Um, like the time lapse, fast forward, like there comes a bird from the forest, it's eaten some seeds, it's now sitting in this beautiful tree after there's been a fire, but the tree has managed to survive, and now it's taking a poop, I'm guessing, and the seed is still in its digestive system because it hasn't managed to crunch it because it's too big, or why would the seed manage to make it through the digestive system of the bird in that context? Because birds <clears throat> the seeds have evolved to be dispersed by birds so they typically have a hard uh, coating around them and birds have very quick uh, metabolisms so it can go from beak to uh, cloaca uh, so in other words from mouth to ass in a few minutes even well. Um, so it's very quick flashing and it doesn't have time to um, break down the seed. But what it does do is it scarifies the seed. And so now the seed lands in a, a puddle of warm, nutrient, nitrogen-rich uh, fertilizer. And it's the perfect starter environment, wet and moist, for it to, to set root. Mm. And warm, too, should it? Mm. <clears throat> that's critical. Mm. I know that when I've sprouted um, mung beans, mm. for example, they sprout a lot faster in warm water. So it's so fascinating to kind of think that the trees would have adapted to evolve with the, with the mutual interaction with birds in such a way. It sounds so perfect. It sounds almost too good to be orchestrated. You couldn't design that. It has to kind of, you have to fall into it in almost in a way. Um, wow, that's really cool. There's a very cool plant that occurs in our mountains called Gallium tomentosum. Mm -hmm. And it's a member of the coffee family. And it, the tomentosum part, tomentose means hairy. So it's got these um, tails, if you want to call them that, on the seed, which are these long fluffy tails, almost like pipe cleaners. And um, is that what those were? Those things we used to bend as kids? Pipe cleaners. Mm -hmm. What kind of pipe? Maybe a little tobacco <laughs> pipe rather than a, like a sewerage pipe. But at any rate. Straws, maybe. <laughs> um, so guess what those little tails are for? What is they attract birds? Why? Because you're going to tell me. The birds line their nests with it. And so the nests are lined with this warm, fluffy tail. And you see them wound into the fabric of the nest. But the seed drops out exactly where it wants to be, which is underneath a tree. The reason it wants to be there is it's a climber and it has little hairs on the edges of the leaf. And these hairs allow it to grip a tree and thus to climb up. And um, so it's known as sticky willy. And, and if you like take it and you throw it against your clothes, it kind of sticks to it. Cloth. Even your, if you've got a hairy arm like mine, it'll even stick to that or your skin. So yeah, it's pretty cool. How do you spell that? Willy or sticky? <laughs> no, no, Gallium. Willy. 
Huh? The usual way. W I L L Y or W I L L Y? Yes, it will. Well, I thought it might be named after some guy named Willie. And could be the short guy. Short Wiley? Wiley? <laughs> William. William. William, maybe that just yeah. was originally a William, but then it might have been a Bill, Sticky Bill. <laughs> what did you say? Gallium Tormentosum. Exactly. Gallium Very good, Edward. Star student. Sure. Okay, so the the birds line their nest with this, and it's perfect because the seed drops out under the tree. It's a climber. It can it can root in the ground because it's got a bit of shade, which is probably what it needs. And do, 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 off it goes, getting some assistance from the tree. And will that be the same? Is 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 that within the spectrum of acacias, or is that a different kind of tree that they would be? Finding themselves underneath. Um, any tree. Okay. Okay. I want to go back to something that you said in the beginning. You said that Casa Bio was a collaborative archive for plants and animals primarily. Plants and animals, but I thought you said that Casa stood for collaborative archive of South African biodiversity. There we go, South African. SA but biodiversity. it's not really South African. It's it's more global now. Yeah. Okay. It's just that CAG bio didn't work so well. <laughs> Collaborative archive of global <laughs> biodiversity. Uh, I also uh, I like that word nomenclature. Well, how do you pronounce it? Nomenclature. Nomenclature. Mm. Which is the collection of words that we use to define, to taxonomically define organisms. It is interesting, you used the word organism earlier instead of using the word plant. You were talking about how... Generally, uh, because I, being a botanist, I tend to constrain things by talking about plants, but what I should be talking about is organisms, because okay. I mean plants and animals. Okay, and I'm just wondering in that context, if, if the thing that they do... Oh, I've lost my note on it. Oh, yes, you were talking about pollination. You talked about bees. You said bees are involved in poll pollination. They're a keystone of pollination. And they help to pollinate organisms. You didn't use the word plants. Are there other things that bees pollinate other than what I would commonly construe as a plant? Like, are they involved in... Other, other bees? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good enough answer. I'll take it. Um, I'll take no, it. I mean, pollination is plants. So, okay. Uh, mosses are plants, but they don't require, require pollination. They are pollinated by, they have sperm. Mm. And the sperm swims to the next archegonium, to the next uh, female mossy uh, flower analog. And that's why they need to be in wet environments because the sperm needs to swim in a wet environment in order to reach the next moss. So are we more closely related to moss than we are to say a seed a seed bearing plant or is that too much of a stretch i think it's true <laughs> i <laughs> certainly am um no i mean mosses are are considered a an ancient organism in the sense that they've been uh around for a very long time in a similar form um but uh, i would say there's other things we're more closely related to them Okay, and then the other thing about organisms, um, it, the, the difference between calling it a plant and calling it an organism is when I think of an organism, the tiny bit of biology that I got in when I was at school basically gave me a, a more defined perception of what an organism is. Whereas if I think of a plant, I just kind of, I think of it as a single entity, not overly complex. Because I use the word plant, it's like, ah, it's a plant. Mm -hmm. But upon further or, uh, organization, upon further examination, I see that it is very defined and that it has a lot of very intricate little systems that are interacting. If we dissect as we do in a scientific manner to, to discern what, what is happening in a place, we've got to like divide it up so that we can analyze. I'm trying, yeah, I can't remember what the etymology of analyze is, but I think it's also like a Greek. Anal? Analyze. <laughs> Using your hind gut to examine things. Your gut instinct. 
Take three. <laughs> um, okay, you talked about seeds evolved to be dispersed by birds. And... So on that, that's an interesting topic. So we tend to think of, we know and we're aware that a very large fraction of our makeup is bacteria, right? So our gut, as an example, would not work without bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, um, how much do you think plants have other organisms within them? Ask me that question as a what question? So what proportion of plants are plant DNA? What else is there that ex coexists with plants? Other than its DNA. So, so else? no, yeah. So what else in a plant? If you look at a plant, you see just the plant, right? Yes. What else is there that inhabits plants? Ooh. I did not know. Do plants have bacteria in them the same way that human beings do? Well, there's bacteria. We know about peas, Fabaceae, and... Uh, and they have a mutualism with, uh, fun, uh, with bacteria that allows them to. Hello, James. Hello. Greetings. <laughs> How I, the I wager wow. there's at least one follower. It's probably yourself. It's me, <laughs> me following. Yes. You're talking about plants and. Oh yes, yes. So, I didn't know it, but they've found a number of endophytic fungi yeah. that cohabit plants. So this. In phyta, phyta is the Greek for plant, and endo means within. So within plants, fungi that occur there. And when doing genetic sampling, you often get contamination of fungi. Okay. And that's because they're living in the tissues of the plant. And when a plant dies, sometimes you see a mushroom emerge from it. Mm. That is the fruiting body of a fungus that may have been inhabiting it for tens, even hundreds or thousands of years, never showing itself, never reproducing until that plant dies. And then out comes this mushroom. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's one chance to put out spores and find another organism to uh, infect. So, but just like we have bacteria that inhabit our body, there's never been a utility discovered for the endophytes within plants, the fungi, the bacteria within plants. I say never. I haven't encountered it. Maybe in the case of bacteria, yes, but not fungi. They're considered, they're considered contaminants. So I still don't understand why. <clears throat> you, okay, you said endophytic fungi. So are all fungi not endophytic? What does endophytic mean? Endophytic. Endophytic means within plants. Endophytic. What's the etymology? Endo within phyto plant. Okay, phyto. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Phyto. Like phyto force. Okay, in the, in, <laughs> internal. Yeah. So, yes, fungi are definitely not all within plants. Okay. What's the reason that you refer to it as infecting? Um, because we tend to think of fungus as infecting things. It infects a body, it infects a, uh, your food. So is, is that's why I'm using the word infecting, but it's really just doing the same as any other thing. It's inhabiting it. I mean, a, a plant grows roots into the soil. Surely it's not regarded as infecting, infecting the, soil. the soil. No. Even though it extracts nutrients from there, which maybe there's something else inside of the, the soil that needs those nutrients inside of that whole ecosystem i mean i don't know how big you go in context of an ecosystem mm. but no so i mean it is a pejorative term that we use to essentially say establishing within a i think there's also this notion that um bodies are individuals pristine without coexisting with other organisms so I was simply challenging that saying we are 
not individuals. We are the product of the bacteria and other organisms that inhabit us. And to the extent that if we eat a lot of cheese, for instance, our bacteria, which they found that bacteria get selected for incredibly quickly within our body. So I say within our body, within our gut. So within days, we can have a radical change around of our gut flora. And the implication of this is that our bacteria can feed back to our brain that they want cheese. And when we don't get cheese, we like get angry and we're like, <laughs> must have the cheese. Give me cheese. It's like cocaine crack. Um, but the point being that that's bacteria that's outside of us because in our gut, it's in a tube that extends out our mouth and our anus. So it's outside of us. And yet it's able to communicate with our brain. So things outside of us can communicate with our brain. And thus, uh, what else in the environment can communicate with us? So would I be going too far then to say that you are infecting yourself with cheese? Or is that not the same? <laughs> because because you, you said it interacts with the bacteria environment. It's not the same. I mean, it's not the same as the way that a mushroom goes to feed on a, a body. A mushroom is a fungus. Okay, but, and then cheese is a fungus, isn't it? Cheese is not well, a it's fungus. Well, it's not a fungus, but it's, it's the, the reason that it's cheese, cheese and not milk mm. is because there is a fungi in there that's digesting the sugars mm. of the cheese, isn't it? No, cheese is a product of a fungus, isn't it? <laughs> yes, uh, okay, that would be a better way to dis discern, to, to describe it. Cheese I is a product of a fungus, but it's not a fungus. You're not eating a fungus, yeah. but you're eating the after effect. Yeah. I would say that's probably more like it. Okay. I mean, is yogurt a fungus? No. No. Is it a product of a fungus? To a large extent. Bacteria. Okay. Bacteria versus fungi. Interesting. Yeah, now we're just splitting hairs. Selected. <laughs> what, what you <laughs> said about... Don't have too many to split. <laughs> nah. Get out. Get <laughs> Sorry, out. <laughs> Sorry, I just... Okay. You goad me so, Deacon. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Um, bacteria. You said bacteria are selected incredibly quickly and, and can your gut microbiome can change considerably within days. That, that sounds pretty significant. Is that, that's not the case, obviously, within plants because they don't function on a bacteria-based system? Well, plants eat light and they eat nutrients and they eat carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they are definitely very differently driven to us. And they're known as autophages. You know what that means? Mm, sounds familiar, but I can't recall. I was going to say it means eating itself, but it means eating, like essentially eating light. <laughs> it means sustaining itself just on light. Like autonomous means yeah. uh, navigating the landscape without an external source. Uh, and so autophage just means eating without an external source. Okay, just so light. Light wasn't considered food. Okay. And that's different for an air plant because it doesn't have, it doesn't have roots in the soil. It's extracting water from the air. And yes, but there's sunlight. also other nutrients that um, occur in the air. Um, so one of the characteristics of lichens, uh, which is a combination of um, fungus and algae, mm -hmm. one of the characteristics of lichen is that they can... Uh, uh, capture nitrogen. They can convert nitrogen in the air into nitrates. Um, and nitrates are critical for plant growth. So you can even get fungus, sorry, lichens growing not only on the stems of plants, but on leaves. And these 
fungi then are uh, raining down nitrates onto the plant. And when the leaves fall off and they have nitrogen, a fungus on the le uh, lichens on the leaves, that nitrogen is being released to the tree. So um, what I'm saying is, in the case of epiphytes or air plants, um, epi meaning on, so and phyte being plants, so growing on a plant, epiphyte. Um, in the case of air plants, they may have symbioses with with other things, yeah. and they would extract limited nutrients from nature. So they generally would grow pretty slowly, I'd expect. Okay, so epiphytes have a symbiotic relationship with the other plants that they're interacting with in close proximity to them. Well, they would certainly use other trees as a place to live. Okay, so already like directly on, yeah. if you use the human uh, sort of measurement of space. Yes. Um, but I, I, I don't know about that. It would be a bare investigation. And you mentioned that they capture nitrogen, which, if I understand correctly, human beings also, when we think about breathing air or getting fresh air, most of that is nitrogen, isn't it? It's like more than half of the air that we breathe is nitrogen. 79%, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. So we obviously also consume nitrogen in the same way that these epiphytes do, like that lichen does. Yeah, but we also breathe it out again. So we're not oh, consuming they it. They, con they consume it. They actually mm, they they convert transform it. it into something else. What are they so, so nitrogen in the air is typically N2. Okay. Um, and it's a fairly stable uh, molecule. Yeah. Whereas um, it gets it in the plant with the energy that the plant has, it gets, or the fungus, I should say, or the bacteria, it gets converted, it gets combined with oxygen uh, and then creates nitrates, uh, which is nitrogen and oxygen combined. Whereas we, we don't consume it, we breathe it out, all of it? Surely we digest some of that or assimilate or Not really. metabolize? No. No? No. Okay. Interesting. So then what are the major products of a human then? Like humans? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. We breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Okay. That's the main product. Okay. So we add some carbon to the oxygen and then in the air and mixed in with the nitrogen and all the rest of it. Okay. And then the food we eat gets converted as we're growing into growing tissue, etc. Yeah. Uh, but I guess once we're finished growing, a lot of it is into cell maintenance. Mm. Because as we know, is that our liver gets reconstructed how often? Every, I'm not sure, but I know that your cells replace, all of your cells apparently replace themselves every seven years. I think your skin is one of the fastest to replacing. Do you know? No, I don't. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, cell maintenance, you didn't mention excretion through like uh, sweat glands or defecation. Um, As I'm a, a, I wouldn't I'm imagine a that's this, not a... Would you say that's not a product? No, I wouldn't but, say it's but not if, a product. But if you think about it with a bird, if a bird eats a plant, seed and then it poops it out and then that's a, a good environment for that seed to take root and grow and proliferate surely there's some function that human beings also have in the proliferation of plants and other bacteria and creatures surely we have a function other than just consuming well we provide environments for bacteria okay. so like just about every little squim millimeter of us is, is, has bacteria and they differ under our nails. They differ between our teeth. They've even found that between teeth, there can be a different complement of bacteria, like a different colony of bacteria between different teeth. Yep. That's how specific they are. Uh, our armpits, part of the... the I, eyebrows too. What about eyebrows? They also have bacteria living in them as well. So, yeah, um, so we are bacteria houses, really. We are living ecosystems. There we go.
and, and what is the outcome of that then? If we, we house bacteria, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm trying to get to some end in mind and maybe there isn't, maybe that's a significant point that I need to acknowledge for myself. Maybe There's definitely not an end in mind. The yeah. universe itself is Cy continually cycling and evolving. Compressing back into complexity or non-complexity and back out into what entropy and non-entropy, entropy and reverse entropy. We're getting into cosmology now, which is not a strong point. Of <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. It's good to check. Yeah, he's a botanist, not an astrologer. Okay. What, uh, what question should I ask every botanist? Or what question is a good question to ask a botanist that I might not have thought about because I'm not a botanist myself? Well, I can think of one. Are you a lumper or a splitter? No. <laughs> a lumper or a, or a splitter? No, myself? because not all botanists are interested in taxonomy. That's true. Um, oh, interesting. So, lumper or splitter. I heard him use the word lumper earlier. So, instead of just lumping them all in a in a pile, like these plants are not that different, it's fine, we can lose the species, it's not yeah. different enough. Yes. A splitter is someone who identifies a new mm -hmm. minor shift in the way that that plant interacts with the environment, the way that it looks, the way that it basically is. And that person would say, this is a new plant, this is yes. a new subspecies or mm -hmm. General? Nice, Ed. Yeah, you've more or less summed it up. So it's a very nice summation. So a splitter is someone who will look at a group of organisms in front of them and and identify multiple different species or subspecies within that. Uh, whereas a lumper will aggregate them and say, "Ah, it's all one thing." Or all two things, or whatever. So that's the difference. Okay. And and James is a lumper and I'm a splitter. Well, I take each case in its merits. Well, there you go. And I, but the implication is that I don't. Okay. In no. saying that. No, perhaps that was the wrong way to say. What I say okay, is, maybe you're I believe confidence. in both. Actually, I believe in some cases you need to lump, and some cases you need to split. I would agree with you. If I were to observe, have, having observed both of you in the field, I would say um, that you do do both, and there is importance in both. Mm, definitely. Um, you are more naturally akin to try and find the minor detail difference and potentially see if it's a new species. I don't know what... What's he got in his knee? Uh, he injured his knee. It's just Again? A, some tape. No, it's the same... Selling. You've got to get that knee seen to you, Dave. I did get it seen to James. And what was the clean bill of health? Nice. Oh, Very wonderful. Very good. Is was there another question that you can think of asking a botanist that myself as a botanist, not as a botanist, wouldn't be able to ask you? Wouldn't have thought of asking you. No, because I'm sure you could think of all number of questions to ask a botanist. Okay. Um, but yeah. Uh, what do you like about plants would be a... Yeah, that's a good one. Well, that's not particularly good because it's kind of obvious. So. I know. What got you into botany? Good, but again, quite obvious. Not necessarily. <laughs> what, yeah, what, what do you like about plants? Uh, yeah, no, I didn't say I would want to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a botanist. <laughs> yeah. um, an empirical botanist. I have always liked dabbling. I've always seen myself as a mad scientist. And so in first year university, I wasn't actually sure what I wanted to do. So as I was doing chemistry, physics, botany, biology, and I've always liked animals. But at some point, I met a bunch of birders and was like, there's way too much heat in this field. And uh, <laughs> there's way too much competition. There's not many people interested in plants. So I figured, like, if I'm going to do something and make a difference, one can make a relatively small difference in something like birds, but it's easy to make a difference in plants. Wow. So that was what drew me to plants. Wow, that's really cool that you were able to choose that. I don't think most people choose, choose a speciality in that way. 
I didn't choose to become a beatboxer. <laughs> I didn't choose to become a podcaster either. I just explored and then found along the way. So there wasn't a moment in before that where you had seen plants as opposed to birds and been like, wow, there's something about plants that draws me more so than creatures that are visibly moving. It's a combination of things, but also plants are much easier entry for uh, oh, yeah. identification and documentation. Mm, they don't move around while you're trying to look at them. Exactly. <laughs> the other aspect is if you document a plant in a particular place, you can come back to it exactly. a year it later have, and it should be in the same place. It wouldn't have um, flown away. Whereas so. if, if, if you do the same for a bird, you have no guarantees. <laughs> no. <laughs> Next time you come. Yeah. Cool. I'm, I'm ready to take a little uh, recess and get some tea. Well, good on you. I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs>